Change our lives because that's what your scripture does. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So what we're doing, we're calling it the best summer ever because we are simply just looking at different things that if we apply them to our lives, it would really, really help us to have an actually great summer. So about a month or so ago, we talked about this issue of what it really means to have hope. And we looked at this issue of unforgiveness and how the only way to really have hope in our lives is to really forgive people. And the absolute crazy dynamic that Jesus told us to do, he said, not only do you have to forgive people once a day or twice a day, he said, you have to forgive people 70 times 7. And the idea behind that was to forgive the same person about the same issue in the same day, just repeat it over and over and over again. And that's, that's a lot. And we really broke it down. It was like once every couple minutes. I have a really hard time forgiving somebody about one time a day for the same issue for a week in a row or two days in a row, let alone every couple minutes every day. Every day, right? But that's how he's like, this is the kind of hope that you have to have. You can do it to heaven for me. We just, we, so we've been diving into a lot of this stuff. We looked at the power of our words and the things that we say and all this stuff. Um, if you ever want to, you can go to our, um, our YouTube page, Destination Church, on our YouTube page, you can catch it all of them up there. What we're going to do today is we're going to look at a really interesting story in 1 Kings chapter 17. If you don't have your Bible with you, that's okay. Scroll through your phone or it'll be on the screen behind me. But it's a really crazy story in the sense of if we saw this story and played out in modern times, we would look at this as absolutely crazy. And it is a story of a lady who well, we'll get to in a second, who was just about to die because she was about to starve to die. And Elijah shows up, and here's, well, here's what it says. And what we're going to do is we're going to, after we read this, we're going to take the next four hours and unpack it. <laughs> I'm not that long-winded, y'all. I can agree too. Don't worry about it. All right. First Kings chapter 17, verses 8 through 16. Here's what it says. Then the Lord said to Elijah, go and live in the village of Seraphat, near the city of Sidon. I have instructed a widow there to feed you. So he went to Zarephath. As he arrived at the gates of the village, he saw a widow gathering sticks, and he asked her, Would you please bring me a little cup of a little water and a cup? As she was going to get it, he called to her, said, Bring me a bite of bread too. And she said, I swear by the Lord your God that I don't have a single piece of bread in the house, and I only have a handful of flour left in the jar, a little cooking oil on the bottom of the jug. I will just gather a few sticks to cook this last meal. And then my son and I will die. Verse 13. But Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go ahead and do what I've said. But make a little bread for me first. Then you will have to prepare a meal for yourself and your son. This is what the Lord says. The God of Israel says this. There will always be flour and olive oil left in your containers until the time when the Lord sends rain and the crops will grow again. So she did as Elijah said. And she and Elijah and her family continued to eat for many days. There is always enough flour and olive oil left in her containers, just as the Lord had promised through Elijah. Can you imagine the setting of modern context? A traveling pastor comes through, and a mom and her son, and they're essentially starving to death, and they've got enough for like two pieces of bread, essentially. And he's like, hey, by the way, can I have that? <laughs> that dude is the biggest, you know what, in the history of the world. But this is what God tells him to do. Uh, anybody ever been broke? <laughs> okay, like college day broke where you eat ramen noodles and frozen pizzas were a treat. Remember those days? Those were some interesting days to live off of, right? You look back and you're like, how did I manage? Like, how did I stay afloat? But you did it, right? You did it. You ate 25 cents. That was back in the day when ramen was 25 cents. I don't know what it is now, but you know it's more than that. Um, 35 cents, is that what it is? Oh, it's not that bad. Inflation didn't hit ramen noodles. All right. <laughs> we'll stay we'll with that. We'll stay with that. Um, this is political I'll try to get this morning. <laughs> it just came out. My bad. Like, but I remember being that broke. I remember, like, our first date was Wendy's. Splurging, y'all. First date. But I remember we went on the first nice meal that I took Tina to, I think it was our anniversary. If I'm remembering correctly, she'll probably, I'm probably watching this. We went to a steakhouse in downtown Minneapolis, right? And this was one of those steakhouses, like, you walk down, they bring you up the platter of meat, and they're like, which one? And you're like, that, right? Like, 
four different plates, four different forks. You know what I mean? Like one of those nice places. It's like this is the best meal I've ever had in my life. It was like, here's what I think. I think most people look at their lives as ramen noodles and they're dying rather than a nice steak dinner. They look at their lives and they see themselves without the proper ingredients to make the dinner, to make the life, to have the life that they want to live. They look at their life and they put themselves down going, I can't do this, I can't do this, I can't do this, rather than I can't do this, I can do this. I cannot imagine the absolute desperation that this lady would be feeling at this moment in history in her life. I mean, there's been times where we have had rough times, you know, like we got married when we were young, we had no idea what the heck we were doing. There was there were some rough days, right? We I we've had a car to find out Walmart, okay? Granted, not recently, we're good, okay? But like, you know. When Ruby was really young and stuff like that, like there was, so we've had rough days, right? Those are rough times. And I, but I've never been there where you're looking at a meal and going, this is gonna be the last meal for me and my child. So I cannot imagine the feeling of desperation. And then I can't imagine God showing up in the middle of us feeling in the middle of the desperation, going, watch, watch what I do. This is what I'm going to do. Just watch what plays itself out. Do what I tell you to do. And also, I can't imagine being Elijah in that situation. It doesn't say it, but can you imagine if you're Elijah? How much confidence you have to have in God at this moment? Hold up, God. You want me to do what? You want me to tell the widow, who literally has a handful of flour and just enough to make like two pieces of bread, one for her and one for her son, that you want me to eat first? This is not how this is supposed to play itself out. Because I'm the one that's supposed to be bringing hope and joy, and I'm the one that's supposed to be bringing them food, not them bringing me food. Here's what we have to realize, and here's what I'm listening, trying to learn and trying to realize. We are not limited by what we don't have. We are limited by what we won't give to God. It is not my skills that limit me. It is me not giving my skills, talents, abilities to God and trusting Him. Right? It's not me. It's what I refuse to give and what I want to continue to keep control of that limit everything I have. How many times do we ask God for something, even good things? And God's telling us, He's like, I've given you the ingredients and I've given you the instructions. That's why the title of the sermon is Ingredients and Instructions. I absolutely believe that God has given us Every single person, the ingredients and instructions to bless their lives, to have the things come through the way he wants them to happen. Um, anybody bake? Okay. Okay. I'm not the best baker, but I know how to bake. Okay? So I'm going to share with you a very embarrassing story from a couple months ago. I can make cakes, right? Cakes are not hard to make. You buy a box cake, you throw the oil in it, you mix it up, and you throw the egg in it. It is not hard to bake a cake done it plenty in my life. Well, it was Mother's Day-ish, I think, I think it was Mother's Day, and I decided I was gonna bake a cake for Tina. Why the heck not? I'll make a cake. Don't know what I was thinking. I thought I was gonna make two round cakes, you know, like the little round pans, right? My dumb self decided to go buy, legitimately, two cake mixes instead of one cake mix. Don't know why, never done this before, ever. Right, now granted, it's not like I'm making cakes on a monthly basis, but probably on a yearly basis-ish, maybe even a little less, okay? Right, we give myself a credit, we'll say yearly, okay? It's not yearly, by the way, right? I made a handful of cakes in our marriage, okay? But I can make a cake. And for some dumb reason, in the middle of this, I realized what I did. But my dumb self, instead of just cutting it in half and just scratching and being like, okay, cool, we'll figure this out, and dumping out the rest of the batter, I was stupid enough, okay, it was, to pour all of it into two pans. This thing was thicker than thick, y'all. Not only was it bigger than what it should have been, it was the most dense, dry piece of junk you have ever ate in your life, right? What did I not do? One, I didn't, follow the, I didn't follow the instructions. I had the ingredients, kind of, but I didn't follow the instructions. This is what we do with God. This is what we do with the gospel. We have all the ingredients we have, 
uh, we have instructions, scripture, we just don't follow them. And then we go, why aren't things turning out the way they should? Because like, you boneheads, <laughs> right? You're not following the instructions that I gave you correctly. You're trying to do it your own way. Here's what we have to understand and realize. The word of God won't work for you unless you work for the word of God. It doesn't work unless we do what it says. Unless we work for the word of God. There's a story of a dad. And this dad wanted his kids to read more. And he dad's like me, I want my kids to read more, but instead they play a lot of video games and watch a lot of YouTube. That's the way it goes. And uh, so this dad said, here's the deal, son. You're going to read this book. And at the end of this book, you're going to write a report over the summer. He goes, okay, you're going to get a reward. He goes, I get a reward. He's like, you get a reward when you read the book and write a report. He's like, all right. So he gives his boy his son a book, reads it a little bit. The kid doesn't really read it. He reads a page, skips a bunch, reads, you know, typical middle schooler, right? This is what middle schoolers do, right? If you get a book report, what are they going to do? They watch some TV series on it and then write the book report based off of the TV series. Right, dumb teachers. They, anyways, they fall for it every time. I don't know why. Anyways, um, this is what they do. So this is what this kid did. He thought he was going to get away with it. And throughout the summer, the dad asked some questions. Hey, you learn anything? Got some golden nuggets? He's like, yeah, man, there's some gold in this book. I'm learning so much. Awesome, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So he gets it, writes a report. The dad reads the report. He's like, yeah, you can tell this kid kind of skipped the book, right? Right it couple pages in chapter 1, a couple pages in chapter 5, a couple pages in chapter 12, a couple pages in chapter 19. Read the front, read the intro, read the back of it. You know what I mean? Like, got the ins and outs. So he did. He said, awesome. He gave me a lot of information. So he goes, where's the reward? Dad goes, you told me you read the book. He's like, I did. He goes, I threw at least a couple hundred bucks in there. <laughs> he had everything he needed for the reward, but he didn't do the dad told him to do to get the reward. The word of God doesn't work for you unless we work for the word of God. And here's the thing that stinks. Well, it's great, and it stinks at the same time. It doesn't change for anybody. So people can stand on stages and yell and scream and pound and throw their fist and all, yah, yah, rah, 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 and whatever. It doesn't change. The standards that I have to live by and you have to live by don't change for me. They don't change for you. We are awaiting a reward that we just simply have to use Scripture properly, but we just don't want to. So many people miss out on the rewards that God has and wants for their lives. We simply don't use Scripture the way we should. We treat Christians, right? It's, it's like if I went to the gym, which I probably should have gone to the gym a whole lot this summer, but I haven't. Just the way it goes. And it would be like if I decided to show up and I'm trying to use the leg press machine as a bench press. Now, if you don't know, you can't do that. Okay? It just doesn't work that way. But this is what we try to do with Christianity. We try to do with Scripture all the time. So i got four different lessons that we're going to try to use to help us understand in this story that if we just simply use the ingredients and the instructions that God has given us, we can see the results that this lady saw, no matter what the situation is in our lives. She was essentially as close to her deathbed as you can possibly find. She had one last tiny meal left, and she's like, they were going to starve. Here's the first lesson. God will use you where you are at right now. You don't have to wait till things get better. Well, i got to get my life in order first. I can't count how many times people are like, well, before I can start giving to Jesus, I gotta get my things in order first. Like, you're never gonna get stuff in order. Why? Because it doesn't work that way. Before I start coming to church, man, I have to make sure that I get some stuff figured out because if I walk into church, I might get hit by a lightning bolt. I'm not getting hit by a lightning bolt, so you're not getting hit by lightning bolts, so you're gonna be okay. But this is like some of the things that we kind of come up with in our lives. Like, I just, no. The term grass is greener on the other side, we use this stuff all the time. Right? We all know it's not true, right? The grass is only green when you water it. We've had rain like crazy this summer for the first like six weeks. Our grass outside got mowed more this year, like from, the, from like the end of June, the beginning of the year when we started mowing, it got, more, it got mowed more in that six weeks than in all of last year just because of the rain content. 
Now, the last couple weeks, it's barely rained at all. Now it's like brown is crazy, right? Why? It's only green where you water it. If you don't have hope and joy and peace and a smile and a work ethic and solid habits and good communication skills, now you're not going to have them in your next job. You're not going to have them in your next relationship. You're not going to have them in the next season of life. If you're not generous now, you're not going to be generous later. Right? Uh, it doesn't matter what it is. If, you don't have, if you're not happy now, you're not going to be happy later. Um, there's this phrase. It's called destination addiction. It is this feeling idea that you need something new. You need to go somewhere. You need something else to happen to you to be happy. It's just not true. Right? How many times people are like, oh, if I was just on a golf course, I'd be happier. If I was just on a lake fishing, I'd be happier. If I just had that blue Patel bag, I'd be happier. Right? Like, if I just had a new car, I'd be happier. If I just had the bigger house, I'd be happier. If I just had the house that did a leak every time it rained, okay, maybe then you would be happier. But, right? Like, if, if, if my husband would just treat me this way, our marriage would be fixed. If my wife would just do this, then it'd be different. If my kids would just do this, then I'd be, ah, uh, okay, see, now I'm meddling in your personal lives and you don't like me. Um, <laughs> but this is what we do. We sit there and say, if this situation would just change, it's not true. This lady was on her deathbed, essentially cooking her last meal. Can you imagine how many times this lady must have prayed for more food? Like, legitimately ask yourself this. Like, she's a widow. She did, like, in this day and age, she didn't have a way of, like, making an income. How many times would she have prayed, God, I need food. God, give me some more food. I need some food. Can I get some protein? Can I get some help? Can, can, I, can something happen for me? Good. I'm just wasting away. And she comes down. She's just getting a couple sticks to build the fire to cook her last piece of bread, and the traveling evangelist shows up in her city. <laughs> evangelist is somebody who goes to my church to church to like preach on Sunday mornings. You don't have a bunch anymore because sometimes they're cooking. Sometimes they're amazing. <laughs> Just tell me the truth. <laughs> um, and so he shows up and says, hey, before you eat, give me the last gift. Give it to me. Go ahead. You do, this is the last. I don't have anything left to give you. This is all I've got. And he's like, if you give this to me, God will never let you go hungry. Uh, I'm sorry, y'all. I'm having a really hard time with that guy. I'm having a really hard time with some dude who shows up with that guy. He says that. But here's what she does. She doesn't look at all the times that God made in her eyes didn't come through for her. That God didn't provide her food when she asked for she trusted and said, okay. I know it doesn't seem like this is how God would answer my, my prayers. I know this doesn't look the way that I thought it would look. But it's happening. We judge how life is going, and then we see whether or not God is blessing or not. And this lady didn't do it. This is just what we do, right? If life is going bad, we are like, man, karma is biting me in the butt. I knew I should have cut that person off in traffic. You know what I mean? Like, I knew I shouldn't have done it. Now it's just coming back to get me. Parents, we do this, we're going to be doing this for our kids. You know how I know? Because my parents have done this to me. Oh, yeah. Just that boy's coming back to I remember why. He's just paying you back for all the times, all the attitude that you gave me. Here, Daniel. That's what my mom says. It's my middle name. Crap, I just gave it up. Anyway, there you go. Um, So, like, but that's what we do. Like, oh, it's coming back to bite you in the butt. All the attitude that you gave me, you know? Like, it's like, oh, no, that's not how this thing works. It's not. God doesn't see things the way we see them. Well, he will do those. He'll bring things into our lives that we don't like. Because here's what we'll do. If you go, Lord, we'll use it for a couple weeks to this issue of forgiveness. If you go, Lord, help me to be able to forgive people more or better. You know what he's going to do, right? He's going to bring situations into your life that make you and cause you to forgive people. By the way, those aren't fun situations. That means they screwed you over. That means you stabbed you in the back. That means they lied to you. 
It means they did a whole bunch of stuff that we don't want to actually have happen to us. Right? Lord, help me with patience. <laughs> and the school lets out, and your kids are home all day, and they just, you're about to strangle them. <laughs> your husband takes a week off of work, no, 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 I'm just like, like, right, like, <laughs> bro, this, this is what happens. He puts things in our lives to see these areas grow. It's not easy. It's very real. It's very real. But this is what God does. It's going to look different than the way you pictured it. Anybody get a package from Amazon and they're small and it shows up in a box? And you're like, dude, I ordered headphones, like earbuds, and the box is three feet by three feet. What the heck? This, this can't be it. It looked different than how you pictured it. It was just filled with 90% of it was filled with like stuffing, you know? Just, it's going to look different. But he's going to use the situations that you're in now. Don't judge the life that you're having now. Don't judge your situation. Embrace it. Embrace it. Your marriage may be ready to fall apart, and you may have signed divorce papers yesterday. Embrace it today, whatever it may be. Embrace your life today. The highs and lows and watch God come through. The second thing is this. God is going to use unlikely people. This lady had to have seen her life as a mess. There's no way you're in the situation you see yourself as successful. She saw her life as a disaster. This is all I got left. My son is dying in my arms. You want to feel like the most helpless mom on the planet? You're, you're literally starving your son alongside of you because you can't feed him. There's no way she was the clientele that we think that God was going to use. And God uses her. She saw her life as a mess, but God saw it as a miracle. You may see your life as a mess, and God, like, you are the perfect candidate for me to do the miraculous thing. Because that's what I do. I don't use the people who think they got it all together. They're too cocky, they're too arrogant. I'm going to use the people who look at their life and say, man, it's a mess, it's a disaster. God saw her life, she saw her life as a mess, God saw it as a miracle. God saw it as a miracle. Here's the, it's just small little things. Small little things. Um, you guys garden? I don't. I don't. But I remember doing a science project in elementary school. Because my kids have done it. That's how I remember them. <laughs> you ever put the paper towel down? You put a seed down, put another paper towel down, put a little water in it. A couple days later, what happens? Look at it, get a little sprouts. Get a little seed, get a little sprouts. And then what do you do? You put it in the Put in a little container of dirt, put it in, water the feed, let us sit. Here's what we do. We get a little bit of thing, and we start digging up the dirt in our life. We're really impatient. We want the result instantly. We really do. You guys like, no, you gotta wait. You gotta slow down. What we do is we dig up the dirt. If you ever plant anything like that in those situations, you dig up the dirt just to check and see if the see if the roots are growing. You're pausing the process. You're pausing the growth process. And this is what we do to our lives. We want instantaneous results. We want instantaneous things to happen immediately, and they don't happen this way. And we pause the growth that God is trying to happen in our lives. God's working. He's just working underneath the surface. This lady is on the brink of starving to death, and God tells her to feed a random stranger. See, God sees things in us that we cannot see in ourselves. God's like, William, do you trust me? Do you trust me? This story blows my mind because, it, listen, I've got kids. You know, I've got five of them, if you don't know. So let's just say our food bill from now from five years ago, it looks a little different. They grew up, they eat more, it's crazy. Lots of pasta, lots of, uh, lots of mashed potatoes. You know, like, just the way it goes. Make a mean garlic mashed potatoes, just let you know. But it's better than my cakes, we'll go there, right? It's better than my baking skills. But I can't imagine what this mom had is going through. And the mental capability to see faith. No, no, I'm going to trust God. 
Because I'm telling you, if I'm in these shoes, in her shoes, I'm probably saying a couple of choice words to this dude. You know what I mean? For all, like, for all being a little honest here. You come from God, and you're going to ask me to do what, you little... <laughs> this is my kid. My job is to take care of my kid. God sees things in us that we cannot see in ourselves. I heard a phrase and I wrote it down. It says this. It says, the devil knows your name and calls you by your sin, but God knows your sin and calls you by your name. God's going after you. God cares about you. You. He knows everything that you've done. Everything. Just let that sink in for a second. You mean that one time when I was eight? Yeah. 13? Mm hmm. 16? Uh huh. 21? Uh huh. Oh crap. You mean that one night? That one thing? Yeah. Oh. He knows, right? He knows. He knows about the secret bank accounts. <laughs> he knows about whatever it is. He knows. He goes, I'm here for you. He knew everything that this lady did, all the good decisions, all the bad decisions, and shows up and says, I'm here for you. The low of the low of the Lord was, I'm here for you. God loves you even when you don't love yourself. I'm not so sure this lady loved herself in this moment. I don't know what she was thinking. I don't know what she was going through. But God loves you even when you don't love yourself. The third thing we learn is this, is God will use really unusual, weird strategies. God's math doesn't make sense. Right? It's even worse than Common Core. <laughs> right? Like, I'm not going to lie, guys, I can't do math anymore. I used to. I, used to, I love numbers because I was taught a different way of doing multiplication. I can't do the whole box thing. It just messes me up. I'm like, dude, just put it in a line. I can do that in my head all day long. Still can't tell. I was taught. I was homeschooled third eighth grade. I was taught to do it in my head. I can still do it. I was like, I'm a little like at numbers. Like, I was good at numbers. You may think I'm good at talking a lot. I was good at numbers. You know what I mean? Like, I love stats and all this stuff. I was good at it. Really good at it. Now, the math is just weird. It just is. But God's math is even worse. We think addition is 4 plus 4 equals 8. God's addition starts with subtraction first. We're like, that don't make sense, God. He's like, I know. God's math is worse. All right, so before we blame the public school system, <laughs> just telling you, God's math is worse than the public school system, okay? Or any school system, for that matter. God's math does not make sense. But God's math, all of that does. That's what kingdom math does. Kingdom math doesn't make sense, but kingdom math adds up. It just always does. It always adds up. God's like, watch what I do. But what God tells us to do, God always tells us to give before he ever gives us anything. He's like, are you going to give it to me? This principle, I honestly believe, applies to a lot more than just money. You want your marriage to be blessed? Have you given to me marriage? You want your career to be blessed? Have you given them your career? You want your kids to be blessed? Have you given them your kids? I mean, like, really done it, not hypothetically. Like, have you really said, hey, there are yours? Not yours, and then we put them in 16 bubbles, and they walk around like the bubble boy. Okay? Nobody's actually doing that, but we do it sometimes. I know, I'm a parent. I want to do the same thing. I got a 16-year-old girl, y'all. That's all I want to do. Right? Hoodies sweatpants from here to here, right? <laughs> she can wear extra large stuff with like, I'm good with that. It's hard letting 16 year old girls out of the house to go to the lake. That's hard <laughs> to do. It's hard to do. It's hard to do. The key to math always adds up. God always tells us to give it away so he can make more of it. If I want my kids to follow in faith, I have to actually live out faith myself. And I have to have like, real life for them. I have to. Because they're going to follow my lead and they're going to follow my example. If we can't
cannot be trusted to give what we have. God cannot trust it to give it back to us more than what he's already given us. You want more joy in your house? Then give them your house. You want more finances? Give them your finances. You, you got stuff in your marriage you want to give? Have you really given them everything or just little parts of it you're still blaming it on the side? This is kingdom man. I know it doesn't make sense. This is scripture. It's his instructions and his ingredients. We have two choices. We can continue to botch cake mixes and butcher them all day long you want, and you're going to get the results that you get, or we can follow his ingredients and his instructions and we're going to be blessed by him. I have, an, I have this option, and so do you. What are we doing with the ingredients and the instructions that he has given us? And we see this all throughout Scripture, right? He didn't give Noah a bow. He gave Noah a hundred years and an axe and said, there's the woods, get chopping. Here's some instructions. By the way, that is enough. Like, we think it'd be crazy just building a boat with rain. There was never a thing called rain. What's rain? Like, we can't even imagine that would happen. Right, can you imagine, by the way? Like, we're all just sitting here, God lowers in some voice, and the best Charleston has some voice of mine all the time. Right? And says, this is what you need to do. It's going to take a hundred years to do it. But this thing is going to happen. It's going to destroy the earth that we've never even heard of before. He didn't give them all that. He just gave them the ingredients. And he gave them the instructions and said, go. He gave David. He didn't really give him a way. He didn't give him a sword. In fact, he made it where he couldn't have a sword. He couldn't have armor. He couldn't have all this stuff. Because he was too small for everybody else. He says, you're going to go fight Goliath. This dude is 10 feet tall. I don't know. We'll fall up there. He says, here's a slingshot. Here's some rocks. By the way, he had five rocks. You know why he had five rocks? Goliath had four brothers. Oh. Serious. I'm dead serious. He had four brothers. You never know what he did with those four brothers. I don't know. Maybe they're too scared to run away. I should have said, okay. <laughs> yeah, but you, like, this is what he does. He gives us the ingredients and he gives us the instructions. What we do with them is on us. What do you do with the ingredients? What do you do with the instructions? What do you do with God's biblical ways? What do you do with the scripture? What do you do with the things that he's told us to do? See, this story needed both people to trust God in it, to make it work. Elijah had to do it too. Elijah had to play this thing up. Elijah had to go to her and go, um, ma'am, I know what you just said. You don't have any food in your house, and you're making your last meal. You know how skinny she must have been, by the way. She was about to start. But ma'am, can you make me my meal first? Oh, by the way, God told me to tell you to make my meal first. That's a, that's a scary thing to say. I have. Like, no, I'm going to go down. I don't have to, to do that. So he had to follow God's instructions to trust that God had the ingredients put together. It took both sides of their walk in this thing out to see a crazy miracle take place. And then they had all the food they ever needed. It's like, you'll have everything you ever need if you simply. You follow my ingredients. You follow my instructions. God will use a lot of weird, unfamiliar strategies and use a lot of weird, unlikely people to see the miraculous come about. The fourth thing we learn is this. Is God's promises never fail. God's promises don't fail, but they do involve us. God always wants to partner with us. wants to see our faith grow. All the time. The widow had to obey. Elijah had to obey. They didn't either of them knew how this thing was going to play out. We get the end of the story. We're not in the middle of the story. Hey, that's all. We get the end of it. They both had to trust that God doesn't want this lady to die. Well, I had to go, okay, God, you got to do something because this lady's on her deathbed. The lady had to trust him that God loved her so much even though she was about to starve. You know, she's like, I'm not going to die here. 
God loves me too much for me to die here. There's no way I'm going out like this. You may find yourself in the worst season of your life. From health issues, careers, kids are rebelling, talking back, marriage is all about over, whatever. Financially, you are in a load of debt that you don't want to admit that you're in. At some point, we simply have to go, these are God's instructions and God's dreams. We've got to pull it together and say, I'm not dead yet, so I'm not done yet. I'm not six feet under, so I got something left. And this lady was almost there. And she's like, I ain't dead yet. So I'm not done. I got one last, one last go for this thing. I got one last shot. Do not miss your chance to go. This morning, you can finally say enough's enough. And you can make a decision to say, I am going to put together God's ingredients. I want to follow his instructions. You may look like your life, and you may go, I'm more like this lady than what you realize. That's fine, because God does the miraculous in the middle of your mess. This is what God does. He takes people who are in the mess, who don't think they have anything to offer. He says, watch what I do. Because if you're here, or if you're watching this in six months online somewhere, means you're not dead, which means you're not done. And if you're not dead, God's not done with you yet either. You can find that area, that thing, that addiction, that attitude, that mentality, that relationship, and go, God, I'm going to do whatever you tell me to do. Because I'm not giving up. Because I'm not done yet. And you're not done with me. Only you know, and only God knows. But when are you sick of how your life is playing out? And I don't know what area that looks like, and I don't know how many of these things, situations that you're going, oh, that's me, crap, that's me, oh, that's me. But at some point, if you're in church this morning, if you're listening to like online at some point, aren't you going, okay, there's asking me something to this God thing, something to this Jesus thing, and something to this faith thing. And when at some point are you just simply going to go, you know what, I'm all in. Screw what everybody else says. I'm going to go all in on this faith thing and just see what the heck happens. It's God's ingredients. It's God's instructions. Are you that sick of it yet? Because if, here's our take -home. Anyway, if, if you're newer, I always do a take -home because honestly, I talk for 35 minutes. And nobody can remember anything from 35 minutes. Guys, I can't. I could not preach to you my sermon from three weeks ago off the cuff today. I could I could pull my notes, <laughs> right, and do it. I don't have a good memory. So I don't expect you to either. That's why at the end of it, we do a take home every week. So I go, okay, well, maybe I can remember one thing. Because one sentence is not easier than 35 minutes. So let me ask you this question. What do you have to give to God? What are you sick of? And you're like, I just have to give this to God because I need his instructions. I need his ingredients. I'm sick of doing it my way. I've blamed enough this. I've done enough that. When are you going to be that sick? Or so you just simply say, man, I've got to give it to God. I've got to do it his way. It's his way. Yes, God stretches us. That is a hard thing to do. It's a hard thing to realize. They come to the grip and you're like, wait, it's, it's not my kids' fault. I'm pissed off every day I come home. No. Oh. It's not my wife's fault I'm mad. No. It's not my boss's fault I'm poor. Boss's fault I'm poor. No. It's not his fault I haven't got the roof. But I want it to be, I know. Whatever that is. It's not the school system's fault. My kids are rebelling. No, stop blaming on Dr. Briggs. He's our superintendent. It's not his fault. Knock it off. Right? Like, it's. And just simply go, God, I need to start doing it your way, not my way. 
I've tried my way, but my way's not working. And I don't know what that is, but at some point you've got to get hit that point in your life. It says if you want God's help, you have to give it to God. You want God to do it God's way. So if you get anything, anything out of this morning, ask yourself that question this week. That's our take home. What are you going to give to God and what are you going to do in His way? Because it's His ingredients, His instructions. Here's the awesome thing He's going to use you to do, be a part of your own miracle. He doesn't want anybody else. It's your life. He wants you to be a part of it. It's like, I want to partner with you. I'm a guy who loves you and has a, wants a personal relationship with you, so I want to partner with you to see your life being changed. Yeah, there's fear issues. There's trust issues. There's the unknown. There's the unknown, man. Every year, every school year, when you have five kids, every school year is the unknown. You don't know what the teachers are going to be like. You don't know what the friendships are going to play itself out like. You don't know how the sports are going to play themselves out like. Every year something new. It's the unknown. It's scary. I guarantee you this lady who's sitting in here, and Elijah, as she's walking up, and Elijah starts coming to her, she goes, excuse me, ma'am. Miss, can I bother you? She's got these things. She had no idea what he was about to say. And he's saying it. Can you imagine her head just turning? All the different things that she was going to say. The unknown. She didn't know it was going to play itself out. She didn't know God was going to answer at first. There's a lot of these emotions. Will you trust God in the unknown? Will you really put your faith in the action with his ingredients and his instructions? Let me pray for you this morning. Lord, you know what each individual would say if they could choose to have you do one miracle. 